Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining our webinar today. We're catching this on demand for those of you in the future listening to this recording. I am Scott Mashakian with Europeans and we'll be moderating today's session that we have titled Organic Risk Management in the Produce Industry. So very excited to have John Foster, COO of Wolf & Associates, and uh, Joelle Masso, Chief Scientific Officer with Europeans Microbiology, here with me today to host this webinar. So before we begin, a couple of housekeeping notes. Uh, the webinar is being recorded. Uh, slides and recording will be emailed out to everyone registered within three business days. We'll also post this webinar online on demand. So during the webinar, you can submit questions you have using the webinar sidebar menu. Uh, just select the questions tab, type in your question, then hit the enter key on your keyboard. Remember, you can submit questions throughout the webinar, and after the presentation, there'll be a short Q&A session to answer any questions raised. Okay, well, with that, John, I'll hand this over to you to begin the conversation. All right. Very well, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, uh, Joelle and team. Thanks for uh, asking me to, to talk about this. It's um, it's a, a topic of, of some familiarity at this point, even though the, the regulation changes we'll be talking about only were announced in the Federal Register in January. Uh, it's still pretty fresh uh, to the organic industry, which is where I spend all of my time. Um, so I've, I've been speaking quite a bit about it, and we're just going to do a, a very top-line overview of, of, the, of the key significant regulatory changes that will impact operators for the most part here. Um, there's another whole half of regulatory change that will impact primarily the, the overseers, the certification agencies, and I'm not going to focus on that. I'll focus more on the areas that are relevant to operations. Uh, all right, Joel. First slide, please. Um, so just what is this uh, Strengthening Organic Enforcement, or SOE? I'll re be re referring to it um, from now on. So Strengthening Organic Enforcement is the, is the term that the National Organic Program and USDA gave this initiative several years ago when they first started talking about it. Uh, it is a, uh, as it shows here, newly finalized regulation. It's been in the works for a couple of years, actually. Um, and the origins of it really go back to the 2018 Farm Bill. Uh, and, and that was shaped by some uh, international, uh, fairly significant scale fraud uh, in the grain trade. And that got Congress's attention. So in the 2018 Farm Bill, they uh, authorized funds for the USDA and National Organic Program to, uh, to begin deepening their enforcement um, uh, activities uh, and also improve, deepen the standard to address some of the specific fraud concerns. And you'll hear reflections of that as we go through some of the bullet points. The, the main intention here from Congress is to focus on supporting continued growth of the organic sector. So it was a real vote of confidence from, from Congress uh, indirectly to mitigate fraud, ensuring organic integrity to the, to the great extent possible. Um, and the whole point of that, since keep bear in mind, national the, the standards are first a, a labeling law. So this is about how products are represented to consumers. And so the final priority was to ensure that consumers continue to trust the organic label. That's, that's uh, CPG products on the store shelves, as well as all the organic ingredients leading up to those, those products. Joelle, next slide, please. There we go. So um, we we at Wolf and Associates we've been welcoming this. We contributed a lot of public comment over the last couple of years through the, the many uh, opportunities to do so. It's long overdue, um, and many of us, including myself personally, when I was on National Organic Standards Board, pushed for several of the initiatives that showed up in a different form, but um, the same ultimate um, endpoint. Um, um, so we've been at it for a long time. The, we've noted some deficiencies. I spent years uh, out in the field. So I, I have a kind of a, a field's view of, of some of the problems. So I'm glad to see these initiatives coming. Um, it will absolutely work to minimize and reduce fraud in the system. It, uh, it definitely uh, fills gaps that have been longstanding, particularly around distribution and, and trading activities. Uh, and it will, uh, 
I, I do truly believe it'll help protect the image of organics in the marketplace. And consumer confidence is a really big factor uh, because again, this is first and foremost a labeling regulation. Next slide, please. So what is impacted? You can read the list here, but particularly here, it's formerly excluded operations. And these are primarily uh, traders and brokers who don't take not, who take neither title nor possession to uh, organic ingredients or products, typically ingredients. There's a significant change to import process, uh, significant changes in the expectation for traceability, fraud prevention, some uh, kind of uh, esoteric uh, areas like uh, grower groups and non-retail labels. And then, as I mentioned, significant changes to certification and inspection process, which will only have an indirect impact on operations. Next slide, please. So that was the what, this is the when. So we have 14 months from the publication date, which was January 19th. So by mid-March of 2024, all of these all of these things need to be in place. And that's putting a lot of pressure uh, on uh, the uh, ACAs or accredited certifying agents, because as of that date, all operations need to be in compliance and the certifiers, certifiers need to demonstrate that. Um, so we have, uh, the, it was two months for congressional review and then a 12 month implementation period landing us on March 19th, 2024. So that's the when. Next slide, please. <clears throat> and now the who, this, there are aspects of SOE that will impact every certified organic operation at 100%. Um, this is the largest overhaul of the regulations in 22 years. So uh, not surprising, it will impact everyone. And we'll go through, as we go through the next uh, few slides, I'll point out the ones that are going to relate to some versus some that, that some of the uh, changes that will relate to everyone. Um, in addition, very notably, uh, several thousand, the official estimate is just shy of 4,000 new op operations will be, are expected to be required to be certified for the first time. And these have been operations formerly excluded um, uh, because they didn't take title or possession, and weren't doing any processing. Those uh, at least 4,000 will need to come into certification. That will be just under a 10% a, a boost to the total number of certified operators for, for reference's sake. So that's uh, that's the who. Uh, next slide, please. So um, first item up here, here is that there are uh, big, uh, significant changes for handlers, particularly brokers and distributors, who up until now have been excluded from the mandate of certification. They have not been excluded from the mandate of record keeping and prevention of commingling and contamination but they've been exempt, uh, excluded from the mandate of certification. So all of those, those allowances, um, so a broker who arranges a, a bulk shipment of uh, grain in a, in a ship, for example, uh, or a barge, doesn't touch the product physically, doesn't take title to it, just arranges a sale. Those who in the language in the, in the new reg is facilitates trade are now um, likely to be required for certification. This pertains particularly to, to ingredients, but not just bulk handled ingredients. It could be drums of oil, for example. Um, uh, as as not so much finished goods. This is really targeted toward the ingredient sector. So one of the questions to be asking supply chain is, hmm, of, of your own supply chains are, are there any currently uncertified brokers, traders, or handlers in your supply chain. And you should be asking your suppliers that also. So um, the exclusions that were narrowed, there was a possibility in the draft uh, that went to Office of Management and Budget. The previous draft um, uh, had quite a few changes for transportation that ended up not ending up in the final rule. So the transportation agents themselves, the rail car lines or the shipping companies, for example, um, unless they are doing some additive process, uh, breaking cases, processing in some way, um, transportation per, in and of itself is not affected unless you are also cross docking, breaking shipments, um, breaking seals and exposing product. Um, transportation agents would not be uh, included in this revision. Um, next slide, please. 
Now, the significant change here is that uh, for, and this is one that will impact all certified operators, is that fraud prevention risk assessments and fraud prevention plans um, are required for 100% of certified operators. This is one that affects everyone. So what will happen most, most likely what will happen is that your certification agents organic system plan template, some, some call it an application, will be modified to ask a question specific to your own self-assessment of fraud risk. That's not just your operation directly, but it is also going to be inclusive of your supply chains. So once you identify um, through your, your version of risk assessment, um, you'll be asked to pr uh, provide a fraud prevention plan to address each of those risks. So it's not dissimilar from identifying other risks in, for say food safety uh, or bioterrorism prevention. It's not unlike that system, it's very similar to that. But um, that will probably take the form for most of you and those of you kind of who are familiar with it, it'll take the form of um, in 201 um, uh, C, so the self, what is now the self-monitoring section. Next slide, please. So um, I'm going to go quickly through this, but, but this is a significant change for the National Organic Program standards, which have not had grower group standardization procedures articulated. And the NOP is the largest, most far-reaching, global, globally applied standard that does not have grower groups. And this is more, most important for grower groups which consolidate internal control systems um, to be able to apply certification to a much larger group of small, typically small landholders who wouldn't be able to participate uh, for various reasons in, in global trade. This is things like sugar, coffee, cocoa, bananas, um, typically um, in tropical environments, but not exclusively. So grow groups, if, if those kinds of ingredients um, are part of your supply chain, they will likely be impacted um, under this standard also. And the basic <clears throat> change is that there are codified expectations around the number of grower, of individuals in each grower group that will be inspected every year and how those inspections are logged and monitored and reported by the internal control system of the grower group um, administration. Uh, additional to that is now in specific instructions to the accredited certifiers about how they will assess the adequacy of all of those um, features uh, of each grower group. That, all, that oversight has also not been articulated until now. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so, so going into, so Office of Management and Budget is kind of the final stop, as many of you know, for, for pending regulation. And what went into the, uh, the, the black box of OMB um, had a lot of changes for non-retail label content and, and a number of things uh, additional to what's currently pre uh, required um, were, went into, uh, into OMB. Um, a lot of detail, including like the certification seal of the last uh, of the last handler. Uh, lot code information has always been required; is still required. Um, but a great deal more information uh, about the identity of the product, um, the number of containers um, that that one unit was a part of. Um, there were eight or 10 things that uh, were suggested to be included, but OMB decided that that was too onerous a, a, an administrative burden because bulk labels are applied in such a diverse environment globally. They felt that it was a, an, an overly onerous task to include uh, the mandate. It would require a great deal more printing hardware to be dispatched in very far flung reaches of the world. And they felt like, and they, the, the uh, Office of General Counsel said that that would uh, be interpreted as a trade barrier actually. So OMB dropped that. What is still required is that the identifying lot code on, the, on each bulk package itself, or in the case of like mm -hmm. grain uh, holds or bulk tankers, the paperwork associated with that how the lot coding has to be directly attributable to the paperwork that is um, that is accompanying the, the load. 
and and that lot code must be easily interpretable as a traceability document um, by any auditor at any point in the distribution chain. Um, the new the new term. Um, uh, Actually, I'll stick with that. The whole point is to facilitate and make more standardized the route through which any observer, government official or quasi-government official like certifiers can do um, not only traceability, but mass balance exercises to make sure that an operator of record is not selling or distributing or shipping more product than um, their production um, capacity has. Um, on, on record. Next slide, please. Um, very briefly, there, there are about 30, about three dozen actually new uh, requirements for certification and inspection. Some will have, they will only be reflected in, in minor ways to operators, but these, some of these will, will um, reflect themselves for each, for operators themselves more directly. So mandatory requirements for inspectors uh, and uh, and the uh, explicit expectation that that traceability and mass balance audits will be done at every inspection. That was common practice. It was in the um, in the manual, but basically guidance uh, for many many years. But not all certifiers, particularly international certifiers, were doing this as a matter of course. It is now an explicit instruction. The, the change will be for those of you with more distant, um, generally outside the US uh, supply chains, those inspections will probably take longer. And the, the need for to have real time access to information during the organic inspection is, is significantly increased. So internet, so having internet access at, at a facility, uh, a distant facility having reliable internet access, um, if that's where your records are in the cloud, having access to that will be an essential part um, from now on. And that that was a little looser before. Um, certifiers uh, will be required to develop a risk-based audit plan that is internal to each certification agent. They'll have to decide for themselves what constitutes a high-risk operation and then what resources do they want to bring to bear on that. Um, the, they will also, uh, certifiers are also now mandated to obtain audit documentation from operators every time. So in the past, a common practice was an inspector would collect audit documentation only if there was some discrepancy, some difference between the organic system plan and what they found, or if the numbers didn't add up. That's changed now. The, the expectation is that all certifiers, all inspections will, will acquire either hard copy or digital copies of audit documentation and, and certifiers will review those to make sure that they, um, they add up literally and figuratively. Um, last one that probably will hit um, indirectly, the, in the instruction from National Organic Program to certifiers is that is to clarify how a uh, percentage of organic ingredients, the composition is, is calculated of, of formulated ingredients. So <clears throat> there was a fair amount of flexibility, but that flexibility is now um, removed. So all formulations will be calculated for uh, compliance with the composition requirements, uh, must be calculated by the weight of ingredients at formulation. There was some flexibility allowed in that uh, prior, but that's gone now. So you'll start seeing that reflected in your inspection process. And if you're a formulated product uh, manufacturer, uh, it, it's somewhere and certified organic, you'll need to demonstrate that you've, you've changed if you needed to. That'll be happening within the next year. Next slide, please. There we go. That's it for me for now. Okay, well, thanks, John. Uh, thanks for giving context. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of what you talked about in respect to SOE and talk about how you would put risk assessment into practice. All right, let me figure out how to advance it. Okay, 
Uh, for those of you who are not aware, uh, Eurofins is a global testing company. So here's all the information about us. But effectively, this will become relevant in my presentation about risk assessment and how to use testing. We do over 200,000 different types of tests. Uh, we're located all over the globe. That's effectively what you need to know from that slide. All right, so taking what John talked about and looking at you know, organic systems plans or organic integrity programs, um, effectively, they're actions that are built to comply or to strengthen the organic integrity of a certified organic product. Uh, they're built to manage risk and increase organic integrity and get somewhat implicit. Uh, they may have intentional issues, something like what John already mentioned in respect to fraud, but there's also a lot of inadvertent you know, issues where it's pesticide drift or storage contamination, lack of inventory control, et cetera. So a lot of these things have been somewhat built into SOE, but were also somewhat already required as, you know, if you were an organic certified entity. Uh, so we're going to talk a little bit about all of those and how you can incorporate testing um, into risk-based management. Effectively, what is that monitoring system uh, for your suppliers or your supply chain? And, and certainly SOE has put in a lot of comments, you know, based upon risk-based, quote unquote, risk-based, risk-based, risk-based. What does that actually mean and how do we apply it? As John already mentioned, mid-March 2024, that's when your OSPs are going to have a requirement to have a fraud prevention plan. Um, and I think there's other things besides fraud that you can kind of take the same paradigm approach to. Uh, I did want to call out, you know, uh, Eurofins is an organic fraud prevention uh, partner with OTA, so we're definitely trying to serve that segment of the food industry um, and bring more accessible tools uh, to organic entities. So risk-based management, I, if you're following along with any food safety standards or obviously with SOE, risk-based has become a really hot topic. Uh, we start to see it thrown around in everything um, as we're, we're talking about things, but what does it actually mean? Uh, Risk-based uh, sounds really nice. It sounds more um, flexible than maybe really prescriptive standards, um, but there's actually you know, a paradigm to risk-based management and you actually need to be able to articulate it. So what does this hot topic mean? Well, it, it certainly doesn't stop with hazard identification. And I think that's where I see most people in respect to whatever quote unquote risk you're looking at, whether it be microbial or toxins or pesticides or organic fraud, is that we, we generally say, look, we've done our risk assessment. We're risk-based management because we've identified what the hazard might be. Um, and that's really, as you can see in this, this cycle here, it's the first step in, in risk-based management is hazard identification. Uh, but it's really not getting to risk management or even risk characterization when you've identified what the risk is. So how do we how do we take that hazard identification list and convert it into something that we can actually manage? And one piece I did want to call out as well, and I think it's really important and relevant to SOE, is that a lot of risk-based management is actually in risk communication. So it's not that you necessarily can eliminate the risk in, in what you're trying to do, but it's being able to articulate what your risk-based management program is able to do to minimize risk. Um, and, and to objectively, as, as you are able, you know, to objectively quantify what kind of risk is in your supply chain. So when we think about organic risk, um, you know, when we can go into different topics, and I will later on in this presentation, but you can think about GMO or you can think about, you know, straight up fraud, it's conventional product that's being sold as organic, uh, pesticides, heavy metals, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Once you identify, so that hazard identification, once you identify something that could be a risk, how do you determine where to spend your time? Because obviously we can't just hyper fixate on any one thing that we identify that could happen. It's just not very functional. So effectively, we've just defined what risk characterization is, right? Not all risks are equal. Uh, we have limited resources, so time, money, and people. So given that, how do, we, how do we make a decision about how and where to manage risk? And, and hazard identification is a really important activity. Uh, your auditors, whether it be for organics or for food safety, will go in and say, well, you know, did you leave out anything? Did you omit something that is an obvious hazard? And, and that's you know, effectively not a good plan. <laughs> it's usually a big gap. Um, but once you've identified something, there's also the expectation that you're going to manage that risk. 
Um, so you think about that in your, your systems plans as well, is that it needs to incorporate not just this is the biggest risk and I'm going to manage that, but I've also, man I've also identified 20 other risks. What do I need to do in the context of my plan to communicate how I'm addressing or not addressing those you know, identified risks? So effectively, you know, your whole program is just looking at how can I develop a program that allocates time where it needs to be spent, uh, where you're gonna have the most impact. And that's what I'm gonna try to give some examples of that. Uh, in any kind of risk-based program, objective, so non-biased risk management is really what you're trying to get at. So it's not something that I just think supplier A is shady and he's risky, so I'm going to, to spend my time there. You, I ideally have a way to objectively create a list of what's risky and not risky. Um, you can look at different things. So GMO is obviously a risk for organics. You certainly don't want to have that in your supply chain. Uh, pesticide, contamination, antibiotics, preservatives, food adulteration itself, and that can be organic, but it could also just be, you know, something that is also a risk to conventional. So, you, you know, you may see uh, recent surveillance activities about honey being adulterated with other sugars. Uh, obviously, that's a problem for organic, um, so you're, you're supposed to be sourcing organic honey, but it's also just a, a food concern where you're actually getting sugar glucose as opposed to honey. Um, process and programs. So this is effectively, when you develop your surveillance program, you're gonna create a process and a program that will incorporate different components to manage those risks. Um, those can be audits, those may be document reviews, it may be random screening, even maybe routine testing um, in your program, or it could be all of the above. And, and this is as we kind of transition from, I've identified my hazards and risks, within my supply chain, how can I incorporate them into a more programmatic fashion? Um, to, in respect to SOE, this is an expectation within your SOP, or sorry, OSP, um, so that you are addressing the risks within your, what could be a very diverse supply chain. Today, as a kind of example, I'm gonna actually focus in on random screening and testing. Obviously coming from a testing company, um, we have a lot of experience with this. I'm just kinda actually gonna use this as an example of how you might design a risk-based management program and how and when you could incorporate testing. Before uh, I go into that, I always like to give my disclaimer about what testing is. And, I, and I'd like to reiterate and kind of get as a foundation um, a restart about testing because I think it means a lot, to a lot of different things to different people. So testing as a tool, uh, a, a scale, let's use this as an example. A, a scale to measure your weight, right? You, it will tell you how heavy you are. Unfortunately for all of us, it's not going to make us gain or lose weight. What I mean by that is I can get on and off it all day long, um, but I'm not going to lose a pound unless I do something with that information, right? So if I say, oh, I'm 10 pounds heavier than I want it to be and I go for a run, then that test was effective to, to tell me something. It is valuable activity. Um, some scales are more accurate than others, so be careful when you're looking at whatever testing um, that you're doing, as you can certainly do a test, but if the range of which it is capable of giving you the information back is not relevant to you, it's not a very valuable test. Um, the other thing about testing that we often don't think about is that it's dynamic, right? It changes um, throughout the day, just like you may probably know, you know exactly when you wanna be weighed because you'll be lighter or heavier. Weight changes throughout the day. So effectively, to just digest that down, right, tests impart information. Uh, the results of a test just convey info. It's not changing anything, right? So it, unless I do something about the information that I get, it alone is not a strategy. Um, it is only useful if I take that information and I do something with it. Um, all tests have limitations. Even the you know, best test on the market has limitation, and it certainly can be broken. Um, so we always need to be, um, you know, observant about testing and not just blatantly trusting it. And certainly, and very importantly, tests are really just moments in time. Um, so, you know, just because you have a test that says something's in compliance or, or even out of compliance, it doesn't mean it's always the narrative and always the situation. So there's just there's the foundation about how do we really use testing as a tool. So 
uh, testing is a measurement. It's not a mitigation. And I think this is ex extremely relevant, you know, to OSB management for SOE is that it doesn't matter if you throw testing into your your program and this is how I'm managing my risk. It does not manage anything. Testing just tells you something, right? It doesn't control anything. And effective testing uh, allows us to make better decisions. So that's really what we should be aiming to design when we're looking for risk-based management programs is to find very effective ways to be valuable in the activities that we're doing. As an example, I'm going to talk about pesticide risk um, to ba basically be able to show you the paradigm of how you could apply this within your supply chain. So when we look at pesticide risk in organics, obviously synthetic toxic pesticides are not allowed, right? So, but there, there are some opportunities for pesticides to be entering into the supply chain. There's unintentional application, um, adjacent land use. Maybe your neighbor is a conventional grower and there's some drift. Um, there's intentional use of it. Maybe somebody would just like the organic premium. And so that would be considered fraud. Um, and then and when you look with, into the NOP, there are allowances. Obviously, we, we are not producing in a bubble, so we are somewhat sub subjected to you know, environmental intrusion. Uh, and, and for those scenarios, we have a 5% allowance for EPA. Um, important to call out though is also 5% of the EPA level for that crop, for that residue. Um, so that's really important. If it's not registered for that crop, then effectively your limit is zero. Um, and it shouldn't be there and organic would not allow it. And if you are found um, to be intentionally doing this, obviously that's, it could be subject to a recall or a fine, which could obviously get really expensive. So pesticide risk, obviously would be something identified within an organic supply chain as a potential risk. So how might we approach that? So let's give an example. All right, so company A procures fresh produce from 10 different suppliers. And these are the items, blueberries, strawberries, spinach, kale, and beets. Uh, companies A's 10 suppliers are located in different places. Some are within the US with California, Oregon, Oregon and Washington, and some are international, Mexico and Chile. All right, so how would we start um, thinking about SOE? How would we start to define risk and manage that program? The, the, ideally, with any kind of risk-based management program, the best data set you can get is objective. So it's going to be limited or you know, free from people's opinions, bias, et cetera. So objective data. It's best to accumulate that data in any metadata. So information that's associated with that data point is usually really critical. Um, to accumulate all of that as you can. Um, use expert resources as able. Those could be researchers, uh, government agencies, uh, and testing laboratories. We, we, have, we have a lot of information um, and a lot of uh, extremely experienced and educated people at testing laboratories, so please use us. Um, sometimes you're forced to make educated guesses. Maybe there are not objective data sets, and that certainly can't be you know, the enemy of starting something is that, well, I don't know anything. You can actually do this with educated guesses based on your experience, your beliefs. Um, but what's critical, especially in that scenario, is I've just kind of reiterated the importance of objective data, right? Is that if you are making educated guesses or incorporating some of your own experiences, which could be more important, quite honestly, than some of the objective data, um, is that you list and describe all of your assumptions. So that when you are viewing your risk-based plan, uh, you know how those decisions were made. So that's just the, the call out, regardless of where you're getting data, always list and describe your assumptions. Um, why is that important? Is effectively to describe what it's worth, right? So the model is a model, it's a risk-based system. Um, it's gonna be based on all of the data that you feed into it, whether it be objective or subjective data. And, and importantly, it's dynamic. It's like this bathroom scale, right? Your weight changes over time and so might this. So you may need to change your risk-based program over time as well. As an example, for just to stay on the pesticide um, train here, is that as an example with pesticide data, where could we find objective data? Uh, the California Department of Pesticide Regulation, they actually have quite a lot of public data uh, on California state testing that they randomly screen um, different commodities. It'll tell you the origin of the results and the EPA limit. Uh, the USDA pesticide data program also has another system where you can query and pull out information. It's a public database from in the 90s all the way to today. Uh, there's some consumer groups and environmental working group that, you know, 
produce their own list, whether or not you agree with it or not. It is an objective list that you're going to be potentially sourcing, and you just list the assumptions or weaknesses of that. Um, and you know, rankings can be based off of all of this information, where you see which commodities, even in a conventional state, may have more apt, uh, more opportunity for pesticide residue, uh, and thereby your organic space may have more risk um, if it's you know a similar commodity. All right. Okay, so back to our company, right? So they had all of these these different suppliers. And company A, they visit all of their California suppliers because that's where they're located and it's relatively easy. And in their on their on-site visits to manage these suppliers, they, they've noted some adjacent land use issues, maybe um, observed some buffer and hedgerow um, uses, uh, maybe minimizing potential risk. Um, they found maybe some questionable storage opportunities. So maybe they are storing product near or adjacent or above you know, conventional products. Everybody else within their supply chain, so those other U.S. states and international countries, um, are getting desk audits. They're not going on site because they don't have the ability to do that. So effectively, we have these 10 produce suppliers, and then we have these different sites and the items of which they procure from them. And effectively, we can start to drive into how do we get to a risk-based management program. So effectively, we're just documenting what we do. So we have the supplier, we have where they're located, we have the item that we're getting. And then the type of management activity that we're implementing, whether it be on-site audits or document reviews, et cetera. And then maybe we have things that we've seen or observed even in the desk audit that we've put into, on into this uh, next column, which is the on-site observation. How do we then get to a place where we can create a system in which we allocate our time? Because right, that's really the important thing about risk-based management programs is that we aren't just blanketly applying the same management on everything, because effectively everything's the same level of risk. So this is just an example of how you can create a qualitative tool that allows you to focus your time on where you think the risks may be, hopefully based on objective data and at least based on information that you could articulate as how you came to this conclusion. Right. So we've got our different items. We've got our different activities and observations. We've now ranked them. So I created here a risk tool, right? So it's a qualitative risk, numeric. Low risk is a one, high risk is a four. In the absence of, of knowing, you can decide to go one way or the other. You could say, well, I'm going to give the middle of the road, maybe a two or a three, or I'm going to say, if I don't know, it's a four. Right, irrespective of how you do it, stay consistent, list your assumptions, and you get to this, right? Okay, well, I've now got uh, a list of suppliers, all of the information about how I'm managing them. I have now prescribed to them a qualitative risk, a number, that's gonna lead to different things. And what you can see here is that four of these ha have a much higher numerical ranking of risk than the others. Um, what does that mean is that they may be of higher risk for me to surveil within my supply chain because of the issues already identified in my tool, right? So now I have a limited amount of resources to look at how do I manage risk. Here's a way that I've now identified where those resources may need to go. So that is effectively making us more efficient and, and be able to articulate what we're doing in terms of managing risk uh, within our supply chain. From that, you can then look at what you can do. Maybe you build a monthly or a quarterly or a season um, sampling system where you look at those higher risk suppliers more prudently or more or by commodity, which ones you think may be more uh, apt to have a residue that would be non-compliant. Um, and then you define your program. But now, importantly, is that you have the construct to say, where in my supply chain is riskier? How might I decide where to put my time and resources? The next important thing is, you know, making sure that you're using the right type of screening package. You know, if you are doing testing, you want to optimize learning um, and, and value over activity. And I think one of the things that's, you know, most infuriating quite honestly at a testing company is that a lot of people just go out and randomly test they'll test for whatever they just i want this you know item tested for this ingredient different residue or whatnot um and that's certainly an activity um and it makes people feel good that they did something um but it may not be a valuable activity it may not be the right residue it may not even be a relevant residue so i think it's really important is to be really thoughtful up front 
to develop a, a risk screening package to recognize that not every uh, testing program or test itself is, is going to be valuable for you. So once you do that, um, I always put the caution out is design your plan of action for results in advance. Right? So don't just go to randomly test something. Um, think about what's going to happen if you get a non-compliant result. Um, should you hold product while it's being tested? Uh, what are the course of what is the course of action if your item is above the EPA tolerance in respect to pesticide residue? Uh, what is the course of action for your company if it's a, a residue level but it is acceptable, so it's less than five percent of the EPA tolerance? What what will you do as an organization? Um, importantly, just don't set it and forget it. Risk is dynamic within supply chains uh, and within suppliers, so you can't just set your program and let it go. Um, it will change over time. You never know what, what may may change. All right. Um, as examples, I, I mean, I talked a lot about pesticides in this one to kind of get through the construct of how you might do a pesticide uh, risk management program, but really it was to, to get to the construct of a risk-based program. But Eurofins does have some uh, organic options, and I think we do have a flyer uh, for after this presentation as well for different information about what we could do within our test packages. Uh, but we have an NOP, so a National Organic Program List Pesticide Package, which uh, identifies the 191 parameters that the USDA has called out for different pesticides. We also have a catcher's pesticide panel, which is over 500 parameters, and we have an expanded catcher's package, which is 648. So you obviously can see there's a different number of parameters, so that gets into make sure that whatever test you're doing is uh, of value to your program. Some are more relevant to others, especially develop, uh, dependent on some of your export markets, where some residues are of much higher interest to those importing countries. Um, from a, another you know, perspective, there's what I kind of bucket more into organic integrity tests. We have you know, glyphosate testing, uh, acid herbicides, antibiotics, hormones. Uh, we have a new test for RBST. Um, I think it's the first test on the market for that. It's obviously not allowed in conventional. Um, but it's never been, uh, it's not allowed in organic. Um, many conventional don't use it, and but it's never been tested before. Um, so we now have a test for that. Uh, GMO, radioactivity, ethylene oxides, the different things that may be applied within the supply chain that you don't even know. Um, heavy metals, um, more dependent on where you're growing, but certainly a risk. Uh, adulteration tests, you know, these are relevant to organics. They are not exclusive to organics, but certainly melamine, honey, um, juice authenticity, stuff where there's a financial reason that somebody may adulterate a product. Um, there's even more of a reason generally with organic products is there's even more of a price premium. So things where we see um, adulteration in the conventional world is, is also very apt to have an issue in organics. All right, so just kind of summaries. Risk management requires risk identification, but that isn't where we stop. Ideally, we want an objective approach to risk-based management. And if we don't have those objective data sets, we would want subjective justification. So just very clear assumptions of how we get there. Uh, testing is a really important tool within risk-based management programs. It doesn't have to be something done all the time, and it certainly doesn't mean millions and millions of tests. What we really want is a well thought through testing program where testing, when we do it, as applied, uh, tells us really important information. So we want to drive value, not activity. We test to learn something, not just to say we didn't you know, check the box, we did a test. Remember, it's not a mitigation, it's just a measurement. Uh, don't set it and forget it. it risks are dynamic. That is ex you know, especially true in the organic supply chain, uh, where we often have to find you know, suppliers all over the world for maybe unique ingredients. Maybe those suppliers change over time. Uh, we certainly want to revisit the risk-based program to make sure resources are being allocated correctly. Um, there are experts that are out there to assist, uh, to help you identify where your high risk and low risk items may be. All right, thank you for your time. I think uh, John and I are here to answer some questions. Perfect, thank you, Joel, John. All right, let's take a look at some of the questions that came in. Um, please do feel free to send in anything additional that you might have and we'll get to what we can. If we uh, don't address what questions you have here, uh, we'll be sure to follow up with you directly after the webinar. So 
let's take a look here. Um, this first question, um, what should I be asking my suppliers? Uh, so I'm, I'm going to assume that's relative to the SOE follow-up. Um, so the first question of, it depends on your supply chain, but all of those major points that I listed are areas that um, are, are kind of in play relative to regulatory change. So any of those items would be questions you should ask about if they're relevant for your supply chain. So if you're not dealing with bananas or coffee or cocoa or sugar, and that's not a concern for you, you can de-emphasize the grower group question probably for your supply chain. Um, oh, honey would be another one for grower groups. Um, um, but the first question should be, um, are, are there any currently uncertified handlers, brokers, traders in, in your supply chain? And that could be in your supply chain. It could also be in your co-manufacturer's supply chain. So it may not be directly, but it may impact you. And the, the hazard that I would say that's a higher risk situation when you hand off basically a turnkey arrangement to a co-packer, co-manufacturer who manages that supply chain and just delivers a finished product. Those co-manufacturers um, need to be aware that they should be asking their suppliers these same questions. And that 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 isn't that will end up being a supply chain risk for you if it's a supply chain risk for your co-manufacturers. That's very important. The critically important is that this this four or so thousand new operations are going to have to be certified at a time when they're already it's um, significant constraints on inspection capacity, both nationally and globally. So there aren't enough inspectors to go around right now. So where 10% were 4,000, probably close to 4,500 new first-time inspections are going to happen. That's, that's dozens of inspectors need to come in and they need to meet, now keep this in mind too, they need to meet new qualification requirements, which are significant upgrades over the current model. So it will be harder to recruit more inspectors and more inspectors are needed. So they expect that a year, Certainly a year from now, if, if, if your supply chain is not preparing right now, odds are very good you'll have an ingredient disruption. So get on it now um, and ask that first question. The uncertified brokers, traders, handlers, that's the big one for me. Um, and then also um, the import requirements, uh, the logging into Customs Border Protection, their ACE system, for those of you who are familiar with it, that is the platform that organic import certificates will be entered into and pulled from. So your, your supply chain needs to be able to provide that information lot by lot to their certifier because only their certifiers will have access to entering data. So that would be another question to ask of your certification agents. How are you preparing for that administrative burden and how are you gonna make sure that that's done in a timely fashion? So if, you've got, um, if you have uh, wheat coming from pick a country and if it sits at the, at the border for a day or two, not such a big deal. But a load of spinach coming over the border from Mexico, every hour matters there. So delays of an hour or two or a day are, have a significant impact on that load. Keep in mind, there will be thousands of these um, transactions, border crossings every day of organic ingredients, organic products. So check into the administrative capacity of your own. How are you gonna communicate that to the certifier? How is your certifier, who you're paying for a service, how is your certifier gonna make sure you're gonna be served? That, those would be the first two questions I'd ask. Perfect, thank you. All right, well, the next question then, a um, bit of a clarification question, I think for you, John. Uh, you mentioned cross-docking as needing to be certified. What's your definition of cross-docking? Yeah, that's that's a squishy term. Um, yeah, the and, and, I, and I will say that the, um, that we, <laughs> the industry has started asking that exactly of the National Organic Program staff. And, and here's the, the squishy answer is, um, the certification agents will be responsible for assessing that what that means. But basically, it, it means that transport in the context of a transportation um, operator, 
transporters who um, who leave seals alone don't need to be certified, generally speaking. So if you have tote, uh, um, pallet totes that are sealed containers and there's no seal being broken there um, by, by a transportation agent who may take a pallet from one load and put it onto a mixed pallet going somewhere else, generally, so that's the, the generic term of cross docking is you, you take loads from one source and build loads for another, for a customer, basically. But as long as seals are not broken, and that all doc and all documentation about that transfer and about that new load build are are transparent and traceable in volume and identity, then the transportation agent themselves is not likely to have to be certified. But once any seal is broken, someone someone needs to ask the question: Wow, do we need to be certified for that? So a container seal. Maybe the answer is maybe. So if you're breaking a container that showed up on in port, you're breaking that container, you're taking out slip sheets or pallets of, of product to go build a load for a customer. Um, you might need to be. That's going to be dependent on uh, and and, I, and I would you would certainly be um, required to maintain all records that provide traceability by volume and identity. And you would be, definitely be on the hook for prevention of any commingling or any contamination with prohibited materials. That that still is the case. It's just about this this mandate of certification, and and that would be a question um, you should ask in either the National Organic Program or uh, or a consultant for that. Um, and and the devil will be in the details there about cross docking specifically. Um, that it, I will say that is one of the first questions that NOP has been asked to clarify. Uh, and I, I will be actually pushing that agenda next week in Atlanta, actually, <laughs> um, because it is, it, there's a lot of subjectivity around the, def, the mixed definitions. But yeah, essentially, if you're breaking, if you're building loads from, from some, some other loads, you're creating a new shipment out of multiple uh, origins, that's, that's a general definition of cross docking. Okay, great. All right, so next question. How do you recommend a prevention method for transport of organic materials? So for example, all of them are transported in some containers of conventional manner, or could it be specific for organics? Um, well, so, um, Typically, it's inspection of the whatever container or vessel you're loading the product into. Make sure there's it's all it's all clean, free of residues uh, and other contaminants. Um, uh, you should inspect it inspect it for the soundness. Like, is this is this box truck actually going to get the product there in one piece? Um, those things I would think you'd do. Most people would do anyway. But specific to organic, there's typically uh, and um, yeah, typically there's an inspection, uh, a transportation inspection log that should be done. And specific to organic, there, there it depends on the, the, man, the containers that the product is going in. If it's completely sealed containers, say drums of oil on pallets, that has a different set of expectations than if you're shipping cartons of broccoli, right, because of the exposure. So, so this goes right back to, to the to what Joel was talking about around risk. You have to assess the, the risk and the need for your actions based on, on the product at hand, the environment it's going into, the distance it's going into. Um, but in general, it's inspection of the, of the vehicle um, relative to the container type and, and exposure potential to, to problematic materials, either commingled, um, with other non-organic components or contaminants or adulterants from from the, uh, prohibited sources. Um, typically, certification agents most will have a um, a set a kind of a transportation check check off list. Some have them online. Others uh, you have to be certified by. But there's several um, versions out there, and those those boxes would would be a pretty good indicator of the things to check for. 
and it, and you can follow up with me afterward and I, I've, I've got some templates that I'd be happy to share that are not not uh, proprietary. I think the one thing you didn't mention, John, and I know you're, you're just saying like kind of generalizations, but you know, thinking about wood-based bins and produce, um, things like the, the package itself, the, the I don't know, container itself, which may be a risk, but I think also relevant in thinking about some different items and commodities is where in the supply chain might it go through? And this gets to a little bit of what SOE is getting at, is that if, if you are a broccoli carton that has holes in it for, for aeration, right, and it's being stored somewhere where they're spraying something else, mm -hmm. um, is this something you now need to understand better, like where your product shows up, where it may be staged, where it may be exposed to something? And then if you have a you know a more complicated supply chain, that's where you'd want to put your resources towards managing mm -hmm. that as opposed mm -hmm. to you know a completely closed carton or even a broccoli carton that goes from you know point A to point B yep. and you have complete control over it. So yep. yeah, or through a hydro cooler. What else yeah. is going through that hydro cooler, for example? Yeah, yeah, good point. Okay. I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two more questions. So this one here are brand owners who sell online direct to customer required to be certified organic under SOE. Yeah, good question. So, so this get this. So we'll go back to um, this is also a question right front and center in front of NOP. Um, the remember that this is a this is a labeling uh, regulation, and that's why National Organic Program is nested under the Ag Marketing Service. So, um, and you know, if you look at the two, uh, 7 CFR 205, um, that is the organic regulation. You'll notice that the labeling section is longer than the crop production, livestock, and handling sections combined. So this is really about labeling. So, and representation, and all targeted toward making sure the consumer gets what they think they're getting. Um, so, so the, sh the short answer should be yes. If you it doesn't matter the, if, if you're making certified organic claims on agriculture products to consumers in the U S you need to be certified to do so. Um, the platform that you're selling it through matters, matters less. There are some exceptions for, um, total dollar revenue, for example, there are exceptions there. Are, again, there are ex exceptions for, uh, the mandate of certification, but not for, um, so, so this would be like at a farmer's market, for example, where revenue may be, um, may be lower, but um, you're still on the hook to make sure it's not coming, uh, organic broccoli is not commingled with conventional broccoli or not otherwise exposed to prohibited materials. So um, if, if you're making, yeah, the, the rule is quite clear. If you're making claims about agricultural products, and, and it's got an organic claim on it as defined in the regulation, then you need to be certified online or not. It, I will say it's, it's slower to be caught um, online than, than elsewhere. Most retailers now are pretty good about checking um, certification status, um, but online is really the wild west. So um, I, I plan on getting certified, yes. Yeah, uh, I, I would say if there's an addition to that, sorry, I'm running longer on this, but, but it also depends on how your product is made. So if, if you're, if you are con, if you're selling something online that you're making yourself, that's going to be a different set of certification expectations than if you're having the product made at a co-manufacturer, the co-manufacturer would, would need to be certified their, their processing. There is some squishiness to online sales of product made at it by yourself, and and that would be a question again for NOP or or further consulting for sure. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, I believe we are at time, so we'll have to wrap up our Q and A session. Um, just want to remind everyone. I know there's a few more questions out there. We'll be sure to follow up with you after the webinar. And again. It's, Recording of the webinar along with a copy of the slides will be available about three to business days after. So thanks again, John, Joel, for your expertise presentation today.
thank you everyone for attending. See you next time. Thanks very thank much. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.